So then we get on to Bronk, I'll keep this really short, we always do. First of all, we'd like to thank Helle Panke, Luxembourg Stiftung, Netzwerk Plurale Ökonomik, who all do this with us, Brave New Europe, and then also Oxy, which is our median partner, who also supports us in this. And now I'd like to welcome Branko Milanovic for what's going to be a very special evening. Well, thank you very much. I would, of course, like to thank the, you know, as, as Matthew said, the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, of course, Matthew, Frank, and actually all of you who have come here, despite, the, as, as Matthew said, despite the strike. Uh, Recently, I think it was in Paris where I had a talk, there was also something going on, so I was afraid if enough people would show up, but eventually they did. So I'm very happy also that you were not deterred by the strike. Uh, now let me first make two observations which have to do with this place. First of all, that I noticed that there is a very high inequality here because I'm the only one who doesn't have a beer. Uh, which I think it would be fixed by Matthew after I finish my official talk, I would expect a beer. Uh, and the second thing, I actually enjoyed very much the place because I remember recently, I will not say where it was, but it was one place, which was a kind of a beautiful hall, but made for kind of young people, but it's of course funded by a bank and so on. And I noticed when I went to the bathroom that actually they had to hire an artist to make a graffiti. And I don't think that in Berlin you need to hire people to make graffitis. So I noticed that also tonight. So let me start now. I will speak for about 30 minutes. Obviously I can speak for much longer, but I think there are many topics that I would leave for the questions and answers. And uh, I'm sure that we will have lots of, we can have lots of discussion. We can stay a very long time, but you know, obviously we have to decide what we are going to, to, I mean, to discuss. So let me say that what I'm going to speak today, as you can see from the title, is mostly about global inequality. Unlike uh, what uh, Matthew said before, I think my books are also fun to read, so you should actually buy them. Uh, not only listen to me. Uh, and what is the forthcoming book? This one actually exists in a German translation. I'm sorry that I did not bring the copy of the uh, German uh, translation of Global Inequality. And uh, the next one, which would be published this summer, is called Capitalism Alone. Uh, now, there are similarities between the two. Uh, the first one, as you will see today in my talk, really deals with inequality at the global level, deals also at the national level a little bit, deals with migration and so on. The second one is, I think, more political. It deals with capitalism today. It deals with uh, the two types of capitalism, the liberal capitalism of the United States and how it generates inequality and what I called, uh, uh, using Max Weber's terminology, uh, political capitalism of China. So I will not say more about that, but because this is a topic for another talk, so I hope to come back here maybe in another year. Now, first I would like, I would actually have to start with very sort of a historical overview of global inequality. So don't be bored, don't think it's really something irrelevant, because I hope you would, by the, by the time that I end this historical overview, I think you will understand why I think it's very important to, to have it. First, I would like to start, this is actually the topic of the new book, but I would start to just pointing out that the current period, and I mean the current period from after 1980s to today, the so-called neoliberal period, is a period which is also very unique in human history, is that we have really one mode of production in the entire world, and of course that mode of production is capitalism. Defined in a very sort of uh, usual, very, uh, sort, uh, very, uh, 
uh, how should I say, economic way, in the sense that it is a, that production is carried on privately owned mean oh, privately owned means of production. It is carried with hired labor. It is also decentralized. The coordination is decentralized. And I will not talk about that today. But you know, China I think fits quite well the you know, capitalist mode of production as well. The second very unique feature of this period is the re-emergence of Asia as a significant economic actor and what I call the rebalancing of the world in the sense that already now, but certainly in your generation in another 20 years or so, you will have the entire Pacific Rim of Asia being on the same level of income or almost the same level of income as the entire uh, European Atlantic Rim and obviously the, the American Atlantic Rim. Now, that, part, that type of relationship where, for example, the Netherlands and uh, Yangtze Valley or Germany and parts of China are approximately at the same level of income, has, we only has to go back about half a millennium to find that situation, because that was the situation around 1500, before the rise of the West, before the beginning of the Renaissance, then of course the city-states in Italy, the city-states in the low countries, uh, big cities in Germany, and then uh, eventually with Industrial Revolution in the UK. But <clears throat> We are going with the rise of Asia back to that kind of distribution of economic activity. And I think this is important to realize because of especially my generation, not so much for you, but got used to an idea, mental image of the world where the West was really much richer than anybody else. And that mental image of the world is now changing. And I will show you when I start talking about global inequality, how it is changing and how it will change your own position in the next next 40 or 50 years. Another topic, <coughs> excuse me, is the emergence of the so-called global middle or median class. And at the same time, the shrinkage of the national middle classes. So you have, at first sight, a paradoxical development. You have more people, uh, you will see again that on the graph, who may be called the global middle. I, I don't like the term middle very much because people in the West believe these are really people who are middle class by their own standards. But the West is still much richer than Asia. So in reality, these are people who are around the median of the global income distribution, but that median of global income distribution distribution is relatively modest for people like yourself or people in Germany. Nevertheless, this is the first time also in history that we have, or at least in the last 200 years, that we have thickening of the global middle. And that was not the case before. We had essentially what Danny Kwa called the twin peaks. We had lots of people at a very low level of income and another relatively small peak of people in the West with high level of income. And then I would say something about the past 25 years in the rich world and in maybe if we have the time a little bit about China and Asia <clears throat> and the questions about really the functioning of today's capitalism. I think I, maybe I would leave that for Q&A because we have lots of things to cover. So, let me start with the long run. Um, this graph shows you the estimate. You know, I will not go into the calculations, which are very sort of complicated and require lots of assumptions, but a calculation about in a global inequality. First of all, I have to define what is global inequality. First, it is global in the sense that it includes, in principle, everybody who is living at a given point in time on the Earth. Uh, you can say, like, how do we know incomes today of seven and a half billion people? Obviously, we don't have incomes of seven and a half billion, but what we have, we have first, uh, household survey data that are nationally representative, and they actually are done now on a fairly regular basis by 120 to 150 countries in the world. So there we are covering more than 90% of the population and almost 98% of total income. On top of that, we are currently actually adding uh, data from the countries where we have fiscal data to adjust for the very high 
incomes of top 1%, who are the people who are generally not represented in the surveys. So this is how we do it now, and that's how we are trying to do for the last 20 or 25 years. Obviously, for the past, it was much more difficult. As I said, I'm not going to go into that. There are things like social tables that were used in the past. But somehow, uh, this is based on the work. It doesn't show there on the bottom, but based on the work of uh, Francois Bourguignon and Christian Morrison, then with updates by myself, another person, another professor, Van Zanden. And then we go back to 1820. Now, what is on the vertical axis? It is something which is called the Gini index, which is a measure of inequality. Now, this Gini index is, let's think of the Gini index the way that you think of the temperature. The Gini index goes from the value of zero, where, which is a theoretical value, where everybody has the same income, to another theoretical extreme where one person has the entire income of a place. That place could be Berlin or it could be Germany or it could be the world. Obviously it's a theoretical situation as well because you cannot really have an association of people with everybody at zero income and one person having the entire income. And that's why I say it's useful to think of that as a temperature because the kind of, you know, rich countries Successful rich countries like Germany are at the level of about 35 Gini points, which is of course higher now than it used to be in the 70s, where for example countries like Germany were at 28 Gini points. But as you notice here, the world in 1820 was at 55 Gini points. So this is the very high level of inequality. But what is more important is that level of inequality really shot up, as you can see here, very significantly throughout the 19th century and even the first part of the 20th century. So you ask a question, why did global inequality go up? And the answer is somewhat simple. There are two reasons. First, the rich countries, the what we call today the first world, became much richer during that period. If you suddenly become much richer and everybody else, Africa, Asia, including of course India and China, remain at the same level, you have an increased global inequality. On top of that, in all those countries, and again think of the UK as a paradigmic case, inequality within nation states went up. So we have a rising inequality in the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century driven by both rising inequality between the countries and rising inequality within countries. Now, I'm going to use that distinction quite a lot because you will see it has very strong political meaning. But now just think for a moment what it means. The first one between the countries means that I calculate inequality assuming that everybody in Germany has the same income as the mean in Germany. So I don't introduce any inequality within Germany. And that component is then calculated in the same fashion for the entire world. So as you can see, the fact that the UK and France and Germany and Japan later and the United States became much richer than Asia and Africa would push that component, what I call, you will see it in a minute, location, would push it up. On top of that, within each of those countries, inequality became higher. I call that component for simplicity class, but the idea there is that within each country you had higher differences between, let's suppose, bourgeoisie and workers, landowners and peasants and so on. Then you notice that in the second part of the 20th century, we are at a very high level of global inequality, extremely high level, but not much changes. So it's a very, it's a stable level, but very, very high. And what do you notice in the last decade of the previous century and today? You notice a decline in global inequality. Now, why is global inequality declining and why do we have so many people who to, to want to come to talk about, global, about inequality and global inequality? Global inequality is now declining for the same reason, it's a mirror image of what happened in the first industrial revolution. You now have countries that were very poor in 1970 or 1980, like Vietnam, India, China, Indonesia, that are becoming richer. 
So, like a mirror image of the first industrial revolution, where the West became rich and actually increased inequality, now the countries that are poor are becoming richer and catching up with the West, which is called the economic convergence, and the world is becoming less unequal. But at the same time, within each of those countries, and of course China is a perfect example, you have an increase in within national inequalities. So it's important to kind of realize that today we are living in a time where between inequality, between, uh, the, between a factor, which is the factor of inequality between the countries, is getting smaller <coughs> due to the rise of incomes in Asia, and the factor of within national inequality is increasing. And it's increasing, as we know, in China, in India, in Russia, in the US, in Germany, in the UK, in Italy, practically any country that you take, you have had an increase in the last 20 years. So we have these two phenomena. Now, another reason why I think you should think of what we are now living through as a kind of a mirror image of the Industrial Revolution is that the Industrial Revolution was also associated with deindustrialization. But it was the deindustrialization of India in that case which could not withstand the pressure or the competition from the British textiles. In this case, we have a return. We have now deindustrialization of the West because the middle class in the West and workers in the West cannot basically withstand competitive pressure coming from Asia. So there are many similarities between the two. And I, I, as, I, as I said before, these similarities are really like the two mirror images, but I think they help us understand much better the current uh, period if we do not face only, in the, if we don't really think only of the last 25 years, but think of the 25 years within much longer time horizon. So, what I said before about the distribution between the location and the class component is now displayed in this graph. Now, what you do here, you take the overall Gini coefficient, if you remember in, 19, in 1820, it was like 50 feet, 5 Gini points, and you decompose it into these two parts. Now, there is a location part, which I already explained, and there is a class part. And why did I call it from Karl Marx to Franz Fanon and back to Marx? Because if you are uh, Karl Marx writing Das Kapital, let's suppose around 1850s, well, 1860s and so on, and you don't have a calculation of global inequality. But your main point is the main cleavage, main contradiction is within each nation state, between the rich and the poor, between those who own capital and those who have only labor. That picture is not very untrue if we, when we now look at the data that we have. As you can see here on this graph, it's not ideal, but you can see it. Uh, it's not, you know, it, you don't see the entire slide, but this class component is actually bigger than it appears here on the slide. You have class and location about 50-50. So the cleavage within nation states is important. Now, that's important because it has implication for class struggle, but it's also important because if you have class cleavage as crucial, it also means that the income level of poor people is fairly similar across countries. Poor people in England or Germany may not be much better off than poor people in Africa or India. And that was actually the basis of the entire international solidarity of the workers' movement. So when we do this decomposition, we just don't look simply at numbers. We look really at the story behind the numbers. As you then see, by the mid-20th century and the latter part of the 20th century, location component becomes extremely important. And the class component becomes small. The class component becomes small because essentially from the global perspective, your income is and remains to, remains very much determined by the country where you were born or where you live. And that class component becomes less important because you have had a reduction in within national inequalities in most countries between 1945 and 1980. So it's a very different world, and I put Franz Fanon here, because he was 
I actually thought who could actually represent that world. And he seemed one of the few people who could because in his view, the class struggle or the cleavage or the location of class struggle moved from a struggle within nation state to the global struggle between the first world and the third world. And the entire literature, from Dependencia to Franz Fanon and everybody else, reflects that in 1970s or 1980s. And I think the reason why that literature is in a decline now is because the world has changed. But that literature did reflect, in the same way that Marx in, in 1860s or 1870s, reflected the underlying uh, cleavage which existed. Now, what is now happening in the 21st century? The location cleavage is getting less important because of the rise of Asia. I have to put one caveat, which maybe we'll do the discussion that later. That location cleavage is being shrunk because of Asian convergence. But on the other hand, the absence of convergence in Africa and the fact that Africa is the continent with the largest increase of population might actually lead us in the future to keep that, to actually might keep that location component relatively large. But that's something that I don't know. I will just sort of put you here as a caveat to the shrinking of the location component. On the other hand, the rising inequalities in nation states that I mentioned before are bringing the class cleavage to the fore again. So now you have the situation that the class cleavage is becoming again more important than it was in 1870s. It's not the same level, it's not the same thing as it was in the mid 19th century, first because the level of income is now much higher, but it's really reappearing. Another thing which is also important is to realize that what the location cleavage means, or what location inequality, means that you have an inherent tendency to have high migration. Because if you have high location component, that means that you can increase your income very significantly simply by migrating from a poor country to a rich country. To give you an idea, to, to re sort of realize what it means, is if I were to take EU15 and do the same decomposition, Location component would be small because the difference in mean income between the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany and France and the UK and Spain and Italy is relatively small. Most of inequality would be due to inequalities within each of those countries. As soon as I move to EU28, the location component expands because inequality now is much greater due to the geographical differences in income between poorer countries in the East and the Southeast compared to the West. So the, the world is like sort of mentally, you can sort of think of the world as EU, but much larger and with much greater difference in income. So in the future, we would have then two phenomena which are kind of unpleasant from the inequality point of view. Probably remaining large location component which would push migration by definition, and that migration at the time of globalization is even ideologically difficult to oppose because in principle globalization is free movement of the factors of production, of goods, of services, of uh, ideas. So that component would remain large and migration would remain large, incipient migration or desired migration. On the other hand, the class cleavage would be, become more important. So we, this is, I think, the two major sort of uh, fault lines that we are facing in, in already now, but we will face even more in the 21st century. So now let me ver go very quickly through some of these slides to illustrate the situation with, uh, 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 with Asia. Uh, this slide shows that there are no, you don't see the, the dates there, but this is from the 
19th century to, to today, uh, the, the relative income of China, India, and Indonesia in comparison to England and the Netherlands. And of course, what this graph says is essentially you have the rebound of those countries, and they are going back to their position, which they had in the mid-19th century. Actually, very likely, they are going to a position much higher than that, because we would soon have I mean, by I think, by, with very reasonable calculation of Chinese growth rate being between five and six percent per year, we would have China and urban China in particular actually reaching the level, the, the median level of income of Western Europe by 2030. So 2034, I think, is one of the calculations. So we are having actually seeing what I mentioned before, that rebalancing of relative incomes between Europe and Asia. Uh, the, uh, well, the timeline, you cannot see it, but the timeline is from, oh, sorry, from 1820 to, 90, to 2016. So this minimum here is 1970s or 1980s. Essentially, that was the, the time of the Chinese reforms, 1978. And then, of course, in the case of India, 1991, where actually India also reformed and started growing at a rate which was, you know, more than 3 or 4% per annum. Now, uh, another way to show the Chinese convergence is to compare the distribution of income of China and the United States. In only like uh, 10 years, you, you see on this graph much greater convergence of incomes. If you were to put Germany and France on this graph, you would have the two you know, distributions practically undistinguishable. That means that the two countries have really more or less same average income and more or less same distribution. And of course, China, as you can see in the first graph, was significantly below the United States. And then you had in this graph, you don't see it here, but only 22% of the people who were in the same range of incomes like the US. By the second period, you have something like 60% or 70, I forgot actually, it was 70% of people who are within the range of the US incomes. And probably by now, which is like six years later, you would have even more of a Chinese movement to the right into the American income distribution. So, uh, I also another way to characterize the current period is to think of this as, I think, without doubt, the greatest reshuffle of individual incomes since the Industrial Revolution. I have to explain what it means. The word reshuffle is, is kind of often difficult to translate in other languages, actually. I had the problem with that. But it essentially means, imagine the global income distribution like a stack of cards. And with your if I ask you what is your income, you give me your income, and I then know the entire income of the world, and I know where to place you. And suppose I place you at the 80th percentile of the world, which means that you are better off than 80 percent and poorer than 20 percent. So you're, there is this stack of cards. And what the reshuffling between 1980 and today has meant is that, in particular China, you have had the rise of the Chinese population throughout this deck of cards. People who were in the middle income deciles in China in 1980s were about only at about 23rd percentile in the world. Nowadays, they are at 55th percentile in the world. So the deck has been reshuffled, so their card moved very high up compared to where it was. And as Asia, with lots of people, and it's not only China, it's also Vietnam and Indonesia and others that I mentioned, move through the distribution, you would have displacement of people who are currently in rich countries. Because remember, in this deck of cards, this is a positional question. You have 100 cards. So even if you become better off, your position would shift down if there are people who are coming from below and they become richer than you. And in that sense, 
it is a big reshuffle because again, in a 20 or 30 years, we would be in a new position that many people who are now in rich countries would not, even if their incomes continue rising at very modest rate of 1% per annum and so on, they would shift in the deck of cards lower, simply because new people would come and become richer than they are. And then it has many implications for the rich countries in particular, because you might have, in rich countries like Germany, you might have a distribution of income where you have people who are at the 50th percentile in the world, people at the 80th percentile in the world, and many people who are at the top 5%. Nowadays, in rich countries, you really don't have anybody practically who is below the 75th percentile. And in that sense, in that positional sense, distributions in the rich countries would look more like Latin American distributions. Because, and I'll show you that as my last slide in a minute, there you have people like, obviously Germany is not going to become Brazil, but I'm just telling you in terms of extremes, you have in Brazil people who are at the bottom of the world, the bottom two or three percent in the world, very large middle class and people at the 50th, 60th, 70th percentile. And also people who are at the very top. So European distributions are not going to look so extreme, but positionally, they are actually going to change very significantly because of the rise of Asia. And I think that's one of the things that to keep in mind, because I think it does have, like the shrinkage of the middle class, it does, has, it does have political implications. So now, I, I think actually I have time. Uh, Matthew, what, how many minutes do you still give me? Ten. No, really, you're very generous. <laughs> Okay, so I have then two or three more slides just to show you and then I would stop. This is just to give you an idea how the world income distribution looks because nobody knows that, you know. The data to do that uh, really became only available in the last 10 or 15 years because we didn't have, as I was saying before, household service, we didn't have fiscal data and so on. So this is the, the world income distribution. The line here at $600 per year per person. Now, this is per person. That doesn't mean it's a wage. It means that there is a household income and you divide by the number of people in that household. So that includes children, it includes people who are not working, it includes everybody. But of course, it's very, very low. We are talking of the line, some of you might know, this famous World Bank line, which is now $1.9 per day. So this is like 10% of the people who are that level. So it's essentially subsistence level. And you know, it's also striking to think that that subsistence level has not changed in the last 500 years. It's simply that in 500 years ago, you had more people who are at that level. But you cannot be below that level because you would die. So essentially, we still have about 10% of people who are at the level at which maybe 80% of people lived uh, several hundred years ago, but we still have people like that. Then we have the global median income, which again, as you can see here, is $2,100. Uh, again, it's adjusted for the differences in price levels between the countries. I will not go into these details, but obviously you have to adjust. I mean, you would have actually ideally to adjust even for differences within countries. Obviously, Berlin is more expensive than living in a rural area, but we don't do that because we don't have sufficient data to do that for the world. Uh, and the, the median income is, as you can see, something like about five and a half dollars per day uh, per person. Then you have the global mean, which is in all distributions of income much higher than the global mean, median. And that's another thing to maybe remember from my today's talk. Whenever we talk about the mean income, whenever we talk about GDP per capita, that number is not a totally useful number because it reflects something which is really happening at that position here at the 70th or maybe 65th percentile in the case of Germany of the population. So when we say GDP per capita in Germany went up by 2%, what we are really saying is the person who is at the mean point, which is higher than the median, 
would see his income go by 2% up. But we don't know anything what happened to the person in the median, we don't know anything what happened to the person below the median, and we don't know anything which happened to the person in the top 1%. So uh, this average number, I've actually become a very big critic of this average number, because I think it gives us a misleading picture of reality. It's not a use, useless number, but it's actually uh, misleading, because it really gives us a, a value which is valid only for a small segment of the population. Now, this number here is very important because this is the median income of the people in Western Europe, North America, and Oceania. So, as you can see here, a median person in the rich world, and probably median person in Germany is at that level, I actually have the numbers I should have brought you, uh, is at 95th percentile in the world. So in other words, a median person in Germany who is better off than 50% of Germans and poorer than 50% of Germans is richer than 91% of the world and poorer than 9% of the world. And this is where this reshuffle would actually happen, is that his or her position would, be, uh, would move downward due to the fact that actually there is a convergence of incomes, especially coming from Asia. And very poor people in rich countries are around that point. So whenever we have a discussion about inequality in the rich countries, we have to realize that we are really discussing what is happening in the top 25% of the population. Now, give you, let me give you another way of thinking about this. Uh, we are all talking and we are against the top 1%. But the top 1% depends how you define it. If you say, I'm against the top 1% in Germany, that top 1% in Germany is, of course, part of the top 1% in the world. But so are probably about 6 actually, it is 6% of other Germans who are also part of the global top 1%. In the case of the United States, you have 12% of Americans who are part of the global top 1%. In the case of Switzerland and Singapore, it's 15%. So even the meaning of the top 1% is different, and we have to be sure, actually, whether we are really talking about our own top 5% or we are talking about the uh, top 5% globally. And my last slide is the the one that many of you have seen, and I always have to, well, sometimes I have to end with that if I've spoken too long. Sometimes it comes towards the end. But since I have four minutes left, I will end with this slide. This slide is so-called elephant slide. It became very popular because it really numerically represents and I think uh, gives a very good picture of many of the things that we knew in reality, uh, what happened over the last 25 years. Now, the updated version of this slide is up to 2011, then there is yet another one to 2013, but we are always running behind the events because getting the household survey data from 100 and plus countries really takes time. Not much has changed, but the essential storyline is as follows. You have on the horizontal axis, you have your I mean, position of people in the global income distribution. Again, it goes from the poorest people, who are number one, to the richest 1%, who are number 100. So that, you know, richest 1% is like 70 million people. It's like basically almost like population of Germany. So there are lots of people who are in the global top 1%. And then on the vertical axis, you see the increase in real income between 1988, 2008, or 2011. So the last 25 or even 30 years. And there are three points which are actually key to remember. The first is that you notice that around the middle of the income distribution there, this you cannot see, but you can imagine that's around number 50, uh, you had a large increase in incomes. And of course, these are Asian populations, and I call them for simplicity, China middle class. And actually, if you look at some groups like, you know, third, fourth, fifth, sixth urban decile, or eighth or ninth urban decile of China, they have increased their income by three to four times. So this is an average because it includes, obviously, other groups from different countries. So that's, this is the point A. That's where you had a large increase in real incomes. Then you have point B where you have almost no growth, 
And these people there are richer than the so-called middle class in China. And when you look at who are at that point B, you find that 70% of people there, so two-thirds and more of people there, are from the so-called old rich or old OECD countries, which of course includes really very large share of Germans, Americans, and Japanese with really absence of real growth. And these are really mostly people in the lower part of the distribution of those countries. So you can call them uh, lower or, or you know, lower middle class or middle class of the rich world. And the third group is here at the very top that you notice these are people for a top 1% and they had a very large increase in their real income. Now, that graph becomes even more dramatic if I were, and I will skip that part, if I were to do it in absolute amounts. Because in absolute amounts, this group here, because their income, original income, is so much higher, that group gets almost one half of the increased overall global income. But in percentage terms, it is still, actually, as you can see here, very significant winner. So essentially, and this is where I finish, essentially we have, if you really want to simplify matters, we have basically two winners in this period of globalization. We have the rising middle classes of Asia, and we have the global top or global 5%, which you can call global plutocracy. And we have one loser, uh, and that's really the middle classes of the rich world. So it's a very s gross simplification, but it's basically, I think, correct. And why the graph is again relevant politically, because it gives you immediately the policy options that you have. So if you are there and you say, okay, I would like to help the middle class of my rich country, you have two possible options. You can actually go after China or against China and try to change globalization and the rules and go into the trade war or whatever in order to possibly bring back some of the jobs and to reduce pressure on your middle class. So this is the option that Trump is currently pursuing. I don't think that will be a successful option, but it is, a, I mean, ideologically you can see why that option might come to mind to people. Although, you know, they have not looked at my graph, which is very sort of unfortunate, but they, you know, uh, but I don't have every evidence they say they have, but that's what they're doing. They have intuitive knowledge, which is not based on numbers. Um, but the other possibility is that you can actually say, I would like to go for very redistributive policies within my nation state, which means I would like to take or have policies which would increase taxation, which would actually introduce inheritance tax, which would uh, uh, make transfers more progressive and reduce the gains at the top and increase the uh, gains at the middle. So these are, I think, the two policy options. And again, and we don't have really examples of people who have done that in the last 10 years. Possibly we will have some. I would actually say that the current left wing of the American Democratic Party is very much looking at this option. And I think that more and more uh, maybe left wing politicians would come really to look at that option and not really try to simply undo globalization or to blame the middle classes in the, uh, Asia who are relatively poor to be the main culprits. So I would stop here and then I would be very happy to have Q&A. Thank you very much.